today to talk about wildlife conservation and if I could have the first slide I will prove to you how much you know about wildlife conservation already. One word, two syllables, five letters. Everybody in the room with me? It's easy. You've all been Disney-fied. You all know about Dumbo the elephant and it's just the wrong image it's the wrong image because elephants, even though they're cute at this age, aren't warm and cuddly. They're dangerous and they are endangered. In the last century, in the last hundred years, the population of elephants in Africa has gone down 50%. They're now closer to half a million elephants than uh, any other large number you want to think of. And until 10 years ago, they were being slaughtered for their ivory at a rate that would have exterminated them as wild animals in the next 15 years. And so what we know about elephants is too little and too late. And there's a great deal of interest now in trying to save special species, the so-called charismatic megavertebrates. These are the ones we love, the, peep, the public love, and we're trying to figure out how to save them. But you also know about some other obscure birds and mammals that have been in trouble. Everybody in the room knows what this is. This is the dodo. Dodos made good eating. They were fearless. I'll translate. They were stupid. <laughs> and they're gone. But I wonder how many of you know about the commonest bird in North America. 400 years ago, the passenger pigeon flocked in the billions of individual birds, and they're gone. The last one died in a zoo uh, less than 100 years ago. So even very common species are in trouble at the hand, let's be sexist, at the hand of man. I could say of humans, but uh, even things that you're familiar with. Some of you know what this is, some of you have had them as pets. Where would you go in the world to observe a wild, natural population of hamsters? And the answer, I hate to tell you, is a pet store. Because they're gone in the wild. There were some seen in the 60s, and then they disappeared, re rediscovered in the 70s, but they're essentially gone as wild animals on the planet. So we're living in a really unusual time. You all know about the disappearance of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. We are living in an event in the three and a half billion year history of life, equivalent in magnitude to what took out the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. We're living at an instant in time when the rate of the disappearance of uh, species of plants and animals is 100 to 1,000 times the background rate. And we can make various predictions about what the world is going to look like in your lifetime and in your children's lifetime and with less certainty in your grandchildren's lifetime. But basically, about 50% of the big things on the planet are at threat of extinction in the next, and it doesn't matter whether it's 100, 200, or 1,000 years, because once they're gone, we know natural processes, evolution, will take two, five, or ten million years to replenish the planet with the biodiversity that we count on. And that brings me, before I get into genetics, to why this all matters, why science matters. The future of the planet, of the biosphere, is not good. That we can make two sorts of predictions. We can predict some things and they're bad. There are other things that we are unable to predict that will probably happen that are scary, that are worse than bad. And so my message to students here is that we should use biodiversity as the warning light 
as the canaries in the coal mine. The ecological services that we take for granted are in fact at jeopardy as we take out one rivet at a time, one species at a time, and we cannot predict at what point whole ecosystems and the services they provide will collapse. So one response to this crisis is called conservation biology. And conservation biology, you should be proud to know, is a cliche invented here at UCSD in 1978. And now there's a Society of Conservation Biology and there's a journal and students uh, pursue advanced training in the field of conservation biology. Most of conservation biology is correctly directed at natural history, at ecology, at behavior. But today I'm going to focus on one small part of it, shown here, three lines from the bottom, as genetic aspects of the collapse of populations. What geneticists bring to the table, and again, keep in mind as I go through these absurd little examples, that this is part of a much bigger problem. What geneticists can do is they can help managers define the units for management. How many tigers are there on the planet? Well, how many species of tigers or how many subspecies? Which ones should you put together in a breeding program? Which ones should you keep apart? We help define the units for management and we can do that genetically. We can look back through time and reconstruct the history of a species based on patterns of DNA which tell us a lot about the natural behavior and structure of that population over millions of years. The third thing here is the characterization and maintenance of innate genetic variability. Humans are a fairly variable species. Look around the room or look outside at the crowd and you see an enormous amount of genetic variation. It turns out that as natural species, we are pretty dull. We are not as variable as we should be or would like to be for our genetic health. Most species have a level of innate variability and our best advice to managers now is that you should try to maintain that. And one way of doing that is down in the emergency room managing pedigrees, setting up matings and managing marriages as it were. Why is innate variability so important? I'll have to translate this graphic for you. What it says is variability is positively related to some important things in the life of an individual, a population, or a species. And the most important thing isn't on the list, unfortunately, and that is the ability to resist diseases. If a new disease emerges and comes along and hits a naive population that is isogenic, has no or very little variation, then there's a good chance that that one disease might wipe every individual out. That's not sort of completely hypothetical. We've discovered in the last 15 years that cheetahs are genetically um, disadvantaged. There's very little variation left in cheetahs. In one summer, the world's largest breeding colony of cheetahs lost half its members after a keeper who loved cats brought her domestic cat to work and it infected the cheetahs with the coronavirus that causes uh, feline infectious peritonitis. That's the common disorder, the common lethal disorder of cats in Southern California. These cheetahs had then were discovered to have very little genetic variation. A new disease came along and they couldn't withstand it. A second example, uh, closer to home, are these Chinese deer, the milieu or Pierre David's deer. When they were exposed to an African virus, completely accidentally at the wild animal park, by their proximity to some African animals, they all died. The milieu came through a bottleneck of three individuals in the last hundred years and have virtually no genetic variation left. So these are the genetic basket cases of the wildlife conservation movement. But the important point to remember is that managers should try to maintain variability. How do you do that? Well, a geneticist has cookbooks and we do a lot of very, very sophisticated alchemy or cookery. Uh, under ultra-clean conditions with an enormous amount of taxpayers' money, and you go from a sample of blood to a fingerprint or a sequence or a microsatellite genotype, and it's very rewarding. 
it's fun, and it's applicable to management out in the field. But there's a problem, the blood. How do you walk up to a mother rhino and convince her that the five inch needle you have, you've all had, you all given blood, and they always tell you this won't hurt at all. You simply can't approach an infant rhino while the parent is there and hope to get a blood sample and live to bring it back to the lab. So we couldn't work on rhinos at the park. We really couldn't dream of going to Africa and working on rhinos. There was something wrong with the blood to DNA paradigm. And about 11 years ago, we were fortunate to be in position to take advantage of a brand new approach to doing the genetics of wildlife. And here's a student of mine at an orphanage in northern Thailand demonstrating the two-handed DNA sampling method. And Carlos Garza is simply grooming these orphan gibbons and taking shed hairs, or occasionally plucking a hair. They don't seem to mind. They quite enjoy the attention. And that gave him more than enough DNA to do whatever he wanted to do back here in the laboratory. So a handshake or a piece of paper you've handled will give me enough of your DNA to tell you all sorts of things about your family. And we'll skip on that today. In the last 10 years, we've developed a number of methods that we go under the heading of non-invasive or non-destructive genot genotyping. We started with hair in about uh, 1988, 89, and then I believe we were the first people to show that bird feathers are a rich source of DNA, and the list goes on. And in the subsequent years, what we were fortunate enough to be among the first to try here in Southern California is done everywhere in the world. You can buy kits that allow you to do this in your motel room if you don't want to buy permits or apply for permits to move things internationally. So what 10 years ago was brand new is now universally used by wildlife managers and evolutionary biologists. The first study we did here in San Diego was focused on our closest living relatives, the chimpanzees. And we did that because we knew a lot about human genetics and we could take what we'd learned from humans and apply it to our closest cousins. Chimpanzees are found across West Africa and across Central Africa out to Jane Goodall's site in Tanzania in East Africa. And the question that I want you to think about is, should you take these animals, if you're trying to save them and put them in safe places, should the eastern ones and the western ones be mixed up? Should the central and the eastern be mixed up? What are the natural um, compartments within something we call the chimpanzee? Here is a very complicated slide. And at the bottom right-hand corner are some little family trees of chimpanzees. In blue is the bonobo, or pygmy chimpanzee. Next to it in green are the western chimpanzees. Above them at the 2 o'clock and 1 o'clock position are the central and eastern chimpanzees. And then in carmine, at least to my eyes, are humans. For forget about gorillas and other things on the other side of the slide. What we learn from a genetic pattern like this is that bonobos and common chimpanzees have been separate evolving species for over two million years. So clearly, don't put them together. But how about the green and the gold? They've been separately evolving for over one and a half million years. So clearly, a manager or a wildlife conservationist wouldn't want to bring those individuals together for breeding purposes. And that's the lesson, the genetic lesson, that we're now trying to spread and apply to the management of the survivors of our closest living relatives. So defining evolutionarily significant units is important. Here's a second quick example. These are spider monkeys from South America. They belong to different species and different subspecies. If you mate members of different species or subspecies, you will observe higher neonate mortality. The infants are stillborn or die early in life. This is not good if you're trying to save species. Well, spider monkeys come in boxes to zoos where this sort of accident happens. And it shouldn't surprise you that in the past we didn't know where they came from. We really didn't care. They were spider monkeys. 
and it shouldn't surprise you that the monkeys had never been asked to check the signs on the front of the cage. And so in some cases the zoos actually got it right and in other cases they got it wrong and in some they actually had mixed populations. So genetics again can be used to sort out the evolutionarily significant units. Here's the last example of this kind. Here are three Indian cheetahs that were shot in 1925. Cheetahs range across Africa and from Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan through India. Apart from a few animals in Iran, all the rest were gone by the 1960s. Now the Indians would like to reintroduce cheetahs and so they wonder what were the animals that once roamed across India. And a graduate student, Laurie Eggert, in my lab has been fortunate enough to get DNA from these 1925 skins and begin to develop a profile for what the Indian cheetahs were. And that will allow us eventually to address the question of where would you go to Iran or Africa if you wish to bring animals back to India to reintroduce them. So again, genetics to the rescue, even if it's too late. Now a bridging example. This is a local bird. And I'm going to tell you that it too is different and therefore could or should be saved. But then I'm going to tell you about the big horrible secret of trying to save things in small populations. This is the San Clemente Island loggerhead shrike. There were 14 of these left in the world about 15 years ago. They're now closer to 50 as a result of a major and very expensive effort to save this species. Geneticists came in and Nick Mundy in my lab was able to do studies of birds on San Clemente Island, the southernmost island shown here in white, off the 60 miles off the coast of San Diego, and compare the birds there to those on the mainland that are, have a different subspecies name and those to the northern Channel Islands. They were able, over a period of years, to take small body contour feathers, breast feathers, from these birds without harming them, and gradually put together a genotype for every living member of this bird. And they're shown here as symbols of different kinds according to different genotypes. And the bottom line is, this island bird is different. It's worth saving. Now the other thing is, and this wouldn't surprise a biologist, is that it's a small, isolated, closed population. And that's where the trouble comes. Because small, isolated, closed populations get into genetic problems associated with inbreeding and with the loss of genetic information by chance, by accident. And so in this very complicated slide, I'll draw your attention to the bottom left-hand uh, numbers only. What we found is that over an 80-year period, looking at six or seven different genes on these birds, that today's birds are 20% less variable than birds on this island were 80 years ago. So tick-tock, tick-tock, a genetic doomsday clock is running in this and all other small closed populations. And that brings me to the last big story I want to tell you, was that th this is a very general phenomenon anywhere you go in the globe. Large populations are fragmented, and you might be able to save them, but what you're saving is increasingly getting into genetic difficulties. Two things go on when you fragment a population. First of all, the number of species in the habitat patch goes down. That's well known, it's documented everywhere, including in San Diego County. And then over on the right, the populations of the species that are surviving in the patch begin to lose genetic variability. And they do so at a predicted rate. And we've known that since 1931, but we've never been able to measure it going on in nature. Sure, we can measure something 100 years ago and today, but that's only two points. And I hope everybody in the room knows that graphs based on two points can be very misleading. And so around 1990, we set out to see if the new genetic methods couldn't be used to develop a method of monitoring the genetic decay or collapse of populations. Uh, the consequences of range fragmentation are due to inbreeding and genetic drift, 
And we call these two phenomena together, or processes, genetic erosion. And again, we've known about it for 70 years, but we had no method of measuring it until the new DNA technologies became available. I looked around the world for a study site where a large piece of intact habitat with all the plants and animals there suddenly became fragmented. And I needed lots of fragments. And I discovered an opportunity in southern Thailand where just this situation occurred. In 1986, the government dammed a lowland river in the middle of a national park and flooded a valley 40 miles long and created over 150 small islands. Now the butterflies and the snails and the lizards and the small mammals live quite happily on some of those islands, but they are fragmented. And our prediction is that, of course, they will get into genetic trouble. Could we measure that? This had never been done before. Here's a tiny island. Here's the edge of a much larger island. If you go into that larger island, you find beautiful rainforest and 12 species of small mammals. And so if you build a field station and tow it around the lake and get intrepid graduate students to go out there and suffer the uh, habitat, then over a period of years five, six, seven, and eight, after the flooding of the valley, we sampled small rats and mice, and we took non-invasively, non-destructively, samples of their DNA and studied it back here. For those of you thinking this is quick and easy, I'll point out that there's about 32,000 trap nights of work in this particular story. Here's Dr. Sukumon Srikwan with a trap in which is a small rat. She'll release the rat, taking a small DNA sample. Uh, her favorite animal was, of course, the pencil-tailed tree mouse. And here's what she found. The yellow lines on this graph and the next one show the loss of genetic variability in the early stages of the collapse of these populations relative to the red lines and green lines, which are large islands or the mainland control. This is a tree shrew. This is the tree mouse, yellow line, the small island, losing variability. We have a method now based on nuclear microsatellites of observing, of monitoring the process, and therefore helping managers do something about it before it becomes problematic. Now, I could care less about saving the rats and mice of Thailand. The Thais have a wonderful system of national parks shown here in color. They have more parks set aside than we do. And they do want to save certain animals. So we use the rats and mice as models of the big things that they'd like to save, like the taper. But the taper is too rare to work on. And the other things that they'd like to save are too dangerous to ask your students to go out and work on. And some of them are even so dangerous that I wouldn't go and work on until a graduate student, Laurie Eggert, in my lab showed that you can do the genetics of wild elephants without ever seeing them by extracting and amplifying DNA from their dung balls, which are relatively easy to encounter in the forest. So here are the seven large forests of Thailand which will support elephant populations. But they're all going to get into genetic troubles. So are the northern populations different from the southern? Are the southern ones in more trouble? Now geneticists can go, and without ever endangering their lives, at least from elephant attack, begin to answer these questions. Does this work have to be done in exotic places? No, the spotted owl here in America is exactly the same story. Fragmented populations, the fragments are too far apart, the populations are not viable. So the work can be done here, and it can be done in San Diego County, and should be. Because when you plot all the counties of the United States and you put color on those with the most threatened and endangered species and you distill this all down, you find that San Diego has more threatened and endangered species than any other county in the United States. So we are, if you like, the flagship for how bad it can get or how should we respond to the biodiversity crisis. What can we predict for the future with the disappearance of species? I'm going to summarize in three slides. Why does it matter? The world is going to be dull. There will be fewer species, and many of them are ones we don't like, like cockroaches and house sparrows and dandelions. These are scientific predictions that we can make. We're sure of this. 
Again, the ones we cannot predict, the changes we cannot predict, are the scary ones and the real raison d'etre for trying to save wildlife as a geneticist, as an ecologist, as a behaviorist. So here are some threatened species. And frankly, they're not very appealing to me. They're not very charismatic. They're not doing anything for my heart. And this makes it hard to argue for saving wolves or saving lions that pick up joggers or children or dogs. How are you going to save them? Well, they have a signal, and the signal is worrisome, and we should save them. And we do it in the wild, and we do it in places like the Wild Animal Park. Can we justify bringing animals into captivity in zoos and the Wild Animal Park? And the answer is absolutely, because the research we can do there and only there does allow us to be better in the field. And the education we can do in these institutions is the most powerful way we have of turning the public and the body politic around to recognize the significance of the biodiversity crisis. Mother Nature now needs our help. I'm sure everybody in their own way is able to do something. Thank you very much. Is the process that is ongoing in Southeast Asia ongoing in China and everywhere else? And the answer is absolutely yes. The damming of the Three Gorges on the Yangtze River in China is going to have a negative impact on the river dolphin found there and nowhere else on the planet and all the fisheries that have supported hundreds of millions of people for centuries. And the same thing is going to go on now that peace has broken out in Southeast Asia on the Mekong River which is a hydro engineer's dream. Here is the last untamed giant river of the planet with one of the richest fish and invertebrate faunas, and that too will be destroyed unless the argument can be made and sustained that these things are worth protecting. Are we better off saving generic species, mixing up the subspecies if they're too rare to save on their own merits? Uh, or should we try to go for what we would have called racial purity a hundred years ago? Well, the answer, unfortunately, is taken out of our hands in many cases, and we have no choice. So pooling will be uh, the only way of saving some taxa. Zoos cannot afford to save six subspecies of tigers. The numbers just aren't there. They're very expensive to keep. Purina cat uh, chow won't feed a tiger. So they've decided to focus on two. They'd all like the very largest tiger because that's what the public wants, and they'd like a common tiger because that's what they can get. What about the other four? Well, actually, one of them's gone extinct while they've been worrying about this. So there will be some pooling, and we cannot get around that. Ideally, you would protect natural entities, and you would try to uh, preserve them in nature. Bringing them into captivity is the last thing you want to do. It's much cheaper to provide first aid in the field than it is in an emergency room. Uh, San Diego County has a very large number of threatened and endangered species hanging on in tiny fragments left between the various developments. The governments of this area have come together for the first time in the United States with the state and the federal authorities to develop a multiple species habitat plan. This is, this is a breakthrough. This is the first time organizations have sat and tried to come to terms so as to permit the continuation of development without the intrusion of radical greens who will shut every little development down or make it slower or more expensive. So this is a government response to a, a generic problem that could be exported elsewhere in the United States. We're too early in this experiment to know if it will work. What I can tell you is a genet as a geneticist is that most of the fragments we are saving are too small to save the species the public believe they will save. So present efforts to develop corridors connecting fragments or to buy, sell, and trade blocks of land to make larger blocks are the way, are, are very, um, are the obvious way to go in a bad situation.